All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. Today's podcast is with the love of my life, the father of my children, and my husband, Christopher Patrick Levesque. We're celebrating 10 years married on February 19th, and we're sneaking away to Mexico to celebrate just us. But before we do that, here is a little after bedtime Chris Levesque special. You got a long list of questions where you got a tea. You got a pizza on the way. I do have a pizza on the way. <laughs> One question was, hey, do you guys ever get in fights? Yes. Yes, we do. Just about three minutes ago, Chris <laughs> reminded me that I needed to add a Primal Ranch to every grocery order and then we found one It's in the true. Fridge. It should just be like an automatic, <laughs> it's in the basket. Why, or we need to call Morgan and just say, like, let's double the shipment here. <laughs> because if I'm ordering a pizza or, I don't know, let's think of another scenario. Cob Great and that's swap. not there, then there better be pesto. I can use pesto for the salad. I'll even use pesto for the pizza. Pesto on the pizza is great. I would also use bitchin. I don't know if I'm allowed to product, promote, mm. or whatever. <laughs> bitchin knows you Call like out bitchin. a name. But I would also dip the pizza in the bitchin. I'll be honest, you know, bitchin isn't the best for pizza. The ranch just has a creamier kind of feel. It's just, you know. I don't know. think I'd ever dip a pizza in bitchin'. Crackers, veggies, for sure. But the chipotle or the cilantro, I gotta have like Italian flavors for the pizza. Yeah, but it has, you know, other flavors that are bursting in your mouth as you're eating it. It's just a nice little taste, you know? It is. Bitchin' is good. Anyways, well, yes, I do have pizza on the way. And a Pliny in hand. In hands. <laughs> I am. So what was the question? Do we fight? Mm. Yes, we do. We, I'd say the primary times of argument in the, you know, if you take a historical perspective of the relationship, I think if we start at the beginning, there's the very first arguments, like real true arguments were you know, you're in dating phase and you're hanging out and you're with your friends. You're just constantly with friends and doing social engagements and what have you as you're, oh, lightning outside. There would be times where it would be like, okay, well, what are we eating? And, you know, 
I wasn't focused on like what we were eating or when we were eating it, you know, it was just part of like, Hey, we're going here next. We're going to do this. We're seeing this person or whatever. So we got in some initial arguments about, Hey, I need food. <laughs> yeah. The first fight was that I was like basically starving. <laughs> and I just had assumed like that was, you know, you kind of priority number two after like main maintenance of life for any human <laughs> that you would just feed yourself or like, Hey, raise your little flag, like hungry, you know? Um, and we're like hangry. <laughs> yeah. So that was the initial fight. And that happened a few times in the, in the and beginning. Once I started bringing food and putting it and at I your house, I was fine. Yeah. But I totally had to be like, I'm so sorry, babe. I'll check in with you. Make sure that you <laughs> fed, you're fed. And well, you just, like, your friends you want, you were know? so, it was so fun. Like back in the heyday, when you lived with your college friends after college in what was coined the manor. And it was just like, all the friends were around be going to the beach or going to someone's party or I was up on the weekends, but yeah, there wasn't very many thoughts about food from you guys. You guys were just like on to the next thing. I needed to be talk about not snacking. I needed like snacks in every pocket. <laughs> you did. You did. You needed food love. Not only, you know, then, but now, and I would say currently like nine out of 10 arguments occur between the hours of like 1 and 4 a.m. <laughs> when we are awoken by our baby, <laughs> baby Toshin. And there's a dispute as to the approach to handling him just letting us know that he's awake and that he wants one or both of us. You know, I guess that's the, that's the diplomatic way of me saying <laughs> like, I'm like, let that kid you know, work it out for himself. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a nice way of saying that. I'm just like, let him cry. He's got to cry. He's got to learn. He's got to learn this. You know, yeah. he's got to learn how to put himself back to sleep. I've watched the videos. <laughs> I filled out the worksheets, you know, there's no other way. Um, but that does, it's like this little, it's like a, I don't know. I always used to say like getting married is like getting a facial. I've only received two facials in my life, but it's like, it's like having someone like poke and prod and pop everything on your face and look at every blemish and like pull it all apart. And then you look in the mirror and you're like, my God, like what's below the surface is so revolting and <laughs> challenging. And I think that in a way, sleep training or just not sleeping in general as an adult is the same thing. It's like you end up like, it's a, it's a, in a much gnarlier scale, it's a form of torture for a reason. Like, so sleep deprivation, like it just grinds on you. So our arguments occur during those hours concerning what to do with the crying child and how to approach when to go in what to do as you would imagine i'm like you know let's just turn it off and roll over <laughs> and kelly will take the opposite approach and so well if i'm going to be up and i'm going to be mad about it then i need you to be up and you to be mad about it no it's really hard sleep training is really hard and being awake and hearing your baby cry like i just i i'm horrible at it like i like my insides hurt and so I'm not good at it. And then we're all sleep deprived. I mean, it's not that you're not good at it. It's just that you have like a different, emo I, I mean, I'm not going to speak for you, but I feel like you have a different, different emotional tie to it. Like, I'm like, he's not sick. He's not hungry. He's in a little bed. It's cozy. The temperature is within a range that is acceptable according to various parenting books. Like, he's freaking out because his brain is developing. Right. I mean, like, I forget what it was, whatever the leaps, you know, like they're crying cause they're leaping or, you know, their brain's developing. So it's like, I get it. Anyways, that's when we fight. We also fight just in general about day-to-day -day things. I think, you know, there's with two kids and we do have some help from our nanny and from our family. And, but it's not a ton, 
you know, I think it's not like 12 hours a day, five days a week. It's more targeted, I would say. And I think that's been like in large part, like my desire, like I've just wanted to be with the kids as much as possible because these are very precious times and you never get the last day back again, you know, and they always grow up and now Bashi's like half your size, you know, like all elbows and knees and, you know, he's not going back into like a little, a little baby mode, you know, so I've wanted help, but I've also like not wanted it, you know what I mean? So that creates, I guess, tension at times over time and the ability to do something for yourself and just have an hour to stare at the wall in a quiet house. And so there's, you know, we fight about, you know, time yeah. sometimes, but for the most part, we don't fight for the most part, we're on the same team and, you know, we have this like weekly check-in now, or I don't know, bi-weekly or whatever, where we raise certain grievances, kind of like the old Seinfeld Festivus. The years part of the Festivus is the airing of grievances. So, you know, we had one about a week ago and that was a good opportunity to chat some stuff out. Yeah, but I love those. I think that that's been really productive, especially because you're not doing it in the moment. It's hard not to do it in the moment but you only bring up the stuff that like really matters or that you care about and you do it in a loving way. You hold hands sometimes, we talk it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're good communicators and we have been from the very beginning. Yeah, I mean, you I'm sound like you're like, short. no, I don't know. <laughs> You're a good communicator and you want me to communicate more. And I think that's natural. I think communication is key to everything. That's why diplomacy exists. And that's why, I don't know, if you get an email from the school saying something happened, you're happier than hearing about it from a parent, right? right. Communication is, makes you feel, it builds trust. So yeah, communication. <laughs> We're communicating right now. Yeah, we are. We're communicating and we're taping it, which is fun. So that question, we <laughs> Check answered that. that. So let's start from the beginning. How did you meet and how did you know Kelly was the one? Well, we met, we had two first meetings. I guess that's the way I always used to talk about it. We met at a bar <laughs> like everybody else until they met online. But no, we met in a bar through a mutual friend. And that bar was near the beach in Southern California. And I think it was a generally pleasant interaction, but like nothing truly like memorable about it, you know, for either of us. I mean, it's a bar, there's like, you know, bros being bros and, you know, loud, loud stuff happening. Oh, I remember it totally differently. Todd texted me and he was like, Kelly, come to my parents. We're having a barbecue. There's a friend of mine I brought down from LA. I need you to meet him. And then my girlfriends and I couldn't get out the door in time to get to his parents' house on time. So we met up at the bar and I met Chris. I was flirting so hard. My best flirt. I was fat in the eyelashes. There might've been an arm touch. <laughs> And he was just like, great. Nice to meet you. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Send me your resume. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't have a lot of experience with women or with dating or with super hot girls talking to me. So I just assumed you were just very nice. Like I was like, wow, what a nice person. <laughs> like she's talking to me. We're having fun. That was great. But never in a million years, you know, was I like trying to angle for anything. Like for me being in a bar situation, talking to a pretty girl was like, you know, survival was the primary goal. Like survive, <laughs> survive, survive, say nothing offensive, survive. You know, as you're drinking a couple beers, then you, you know, loosen up. And perhaps I said something 
No, you were so sweet and so humble. And I just couldn't believe that. I mean, I'm so attracted to you and I always have been, but that you just, I was like, does he not look in the mirror? Like this tall, dark and handsome guy and just. Like I was a contestant on The Bachelor. What are you doing here? Yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> no, so that was the initial interaction. And then this is like the very nascent days of Facebook, like literally 2005, I think. 2006, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, 2007 is when I guess you're right. No, it was. It was 2006, yeah. the summer of 2006, then March 2007 was. Facebook there. started in 2004 mm-hmm. in college. Mm-hmm dating myself, but I was a senior. I think that's when it, 05, 06, 07. I mean, you're still needing a .edu to be, log on. Like, you know, yeah. your aunt and uncle aren't on Facebook at this time. So it's purely college kids. And of course I'm like, oh, Kelly Brandlin, where are you? Oh, boom. <laughs> so I followed you, or I don't even know if following existed back then, but I frequently looked at your pictures. <laughs> 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 on my own time without being told by Facebook algorithms to do that. And, you know, you were just like, oh, I'm at the Angels game. And here I am in a jacuzzi with my girlfriends, <laughs> you know, just having kind of fun or whatever. And then we really met or kick things off another friend, the best friend of the initial friend who introduced us, had a birthday party up in L.A., and it was at like, it was at a very like at the green door. It was a club, or it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. It's, it's been turned over to another club in LA now. <sighs> None of them do. But so, anyways, at this point, I had been following slash stalking you on Facebook for like six months or whatever. And unbeknownst to me, there was like an evite for this. This is the story from my perspective, of course. There was an evite. I replied yes. You saw the yes as you were looking at the evite yourself. Yeah. And said, Hey, girls, we need to go to LA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because at the time I had gone to USC and then I had moved back down to Newport Beach to live by the beach with a couple of girlfriends from high school. And that's when we had met at that bar. And then when I did, when I saw the evite, I hadn't seen you but i had also frequented your facebook page to see fun pictures of you at the dodgers game in a jacuzzi with your friends <laughs> i'm not a dodgers fan though i mean i'm not an anti-dodgers person but i'm just teasing but i did I visit your <laughs> i did visit your facebook page and then i saw your name on the evite and i did i rallied friends and i said we got to go to this party I, was, I gotta see the i don't know i just wanted to see you again so there i was at the party at the bar crowded club type scene but like the bar they had like a bar that was like outside of the ns, ns, ns. so you could like you could have a conversation you know it wasn't too loud and and kelly walked in and you know i was young and feeling confident because of the you know i'd had a beer or two And I just literally, she walked in the door and I just yelled her name at her, like yelled it across (laughs) the bar. And there's like, I don't know, 500 people at this place or 200 in the bar or whatever, but just yelled her name directly at her caveman style, just yelled her name. Like, Hey, I identify you. (laughs) You've been identified and I am directing my communication right at you. I was so stoked. And she was like, oh. <laughs> and so we chatted and we then we like danced. And I noticed one of the things initially was like she had these like hands that were they were like ranch hands. Yeah. They were they were not like soft and like they weren't clammy. They were the opposite of that. They were like, oh, does this woman like like they were <laughs> they were rough and I don't know, just like has stuck with me through all these years. Hung out there, went outside, all her friends were there you know, like a little group of six or whatever. And everybody was talking about Coachella. These were the days when like, instead of like being on my couch and watching Coachella on my computer, we actually went. They're like, oh, you guys are going to Coachella. Where are you staying? And I was like, oh, we're staying in a condom. (laughs) And everybody's like, what? I was like, I I mean, a a condominium. 
for staying in a condominium. But I actually said that in front of like, I don't know, like five of your friends and five of mine, like group setting, like half circle. And everybody's like, oh, Chris and Kelly seem to be like chit chatting a little bit. Let's like give them kind of the floor here to like, oh, <laughs> let's talk about things. And I'm like, where are you staying? <laughs> oh, I'm staying in a condom. Sweet. I mean, it was just, it was so bad. Then we went to, we went to an after party up in the hills and there was twinkling lights and there was a pool and we went outside and we had a little kiss. <laughs> Woo. And that was it. Yeah. Pretty much it. The rest is history. Kind of crazy. It's fun to relive these stories from so long ago. I can't believe, I mean, we'll have been married for 10 years on Saturday and been together for like 15 crazy it's a lot of years that's a long time ago but that embarrassing moment obviously seared itself into your brain so <laughs> yeah i mean you just don't picture yourself i mean it just went down in such a natural weird way you know i didn't think uh, twice about it i don't i didn't even remember you saying that i know you told me that story like months after we got together but i didn't even it didn't even phase me i was just too smitten. Well, cheers to that. Cheers Next to question. That. All right. So, how has life changed since we've had kids? If you value your freedom of time <laughs> and your independence as a human, <laughs> children are not for you. It's wonderful. Kids are amazing. It's also it's a lot of work. It's like grunt work. It's like dishes and laundry and cleaning up stuff. It's emotional work. It's teaching. It's trying to create like little balanced, happy little humans to contribute to society for the future and realizing that they're going to raise kids one day. So everything you teach and say to them, they're going to pass on. So it's a lot, but that's why we surf or do yoga or watch Netflix at night to like ease out from that. But like, I mean, how has life changed? I mean, you got to have kids and you'll see, Yeah. you know, it just is, even if you have like a traditional nine to five or, and have to go to an office these days, eight to six with a commute or whatever it ends up being, or seven to seven, like even still then, like it's a total game changer. Your whole priority system changes from uh, self and partner to small dependent children at all times. So what's your favorite part about being a dad? I mean, on the surface, I would say like, I love reading to them. Like I really enjoy reading. I enjoy sports, like being outside, trying different things. I don't know. I'm not like engaging with all the emotion of being a dad and like giving my, you know, speeches at this point, but those are things I love about being a dad on like the surface. I think it's awesome to have a human who, you know, needs you to be better than maybe you think you can be, you know, I think that just showing up is a huge part of the equation, but showing up with fun and ideas and good attitude. I mean, it takes effort. So I like giving that effort even though I don't always have like a ton in the reserves. You're the best dad. I mean, I remember writing like a script, I wrote a script and I was like, you yeah, know, spent two years on it or whatever. And then it was like, okay, it was done. Go write another one. And I was like, how in, how in the F <laughs> am I like, that took so much work and so much imagination and like so much like, so many index cards and so much like so many writes and rewrites and rewrites, you know, like hundreds or thousands of pages of notes and script or whatever, and you have to do it again. And that's almost like what your second child is like. It's like you spend so much time with number one, like, and it's totally uninhibited, like un or not uninhibited. It's like totally uh, uninterrupted. It's just like their show. 
And then you have to like spread that attention. So I'm going to answer a question that wasn't asked, meaning like, what's the best thing about being a dad? What's the worst thing about being a dad? Well, in the current stage, it's like with two kids, like giving them both the attention that they need because they need very different attention. Like Tasha needs like, this is a circle. This is a square, yellow. You know, he needs that. He needs like, you can stand up, you know, like here, grab my arms. Fashi needs like a totally different realm of connection. He needs so much more psychologically at this point now going to school and like just support emotionally. I find that's like the hardest part is like when they're both in the room, it's like having your, it's like having like an 18 year old and like a 80 year old, like that's how far apart it feels like the 18 year old is like, well, I don't know what an 18 year old is up to these days, but their concerns have nothing to do with like, it's like the 80 year old is like the baby. Like they just need the basics. And the 18 year old is like, there's lots of complexity. And I just, just watched euphoria. And what does that mean for me? I mean, that's definitely the hardest for me too, to feel like I want to clone myself when Tashin's trying to climb on me and nurse and that she's like almost reverting and trying to climb on me. And I just would be easier if I could just have two of me. And then I revert and I climb on you <laughs> and I remind you, you don't have two kids. You have three because <laughs> the husband is always the biggest baby. Speaking well, of, most of the time, <laughs> speaking of three, that was a question. Do you want to have three children? I mean, I do. I'm like, you probably have some psychologist you've had on your show, on your program before, and she's going to listen and be like, when he says, I mean, I do, that's like, it's like, he's unsure. He's unsure. I'm unsure only because of like, literally the logistics of it, the emotion of it, the happiness, the joy, the smiles, the fun, like sign me up. But like I said before, like, I'm not, I need help. I want help, but I don't, I also like, don't want it. You know what I mean? So I'm in this weird, like quandary of knowing that it will bring so much to the table. Like your little sister, I mean, like she totally changes the family dynamic. Like, I don't know, I guess many other three kid families I'm trying to think, but like my best friend growing up, he was the third and he was like, I think he's kind of like a unifier, you know, like there's something about being number three. You're usually, it seems like the most independent. You're usually a little mature beyond your years because you have the two people in front of you that show you what's right and what's wrong. So in that sense, I'd be really excited. If we, if it was bash, which I tortured you with bash too, I think we finally got bash sleep trained at like six maybe seven months but this is this has just gotten out of hand well it's not out of hand it's just these are kids they regress they go back they sleep in they don't they sleep in they don't it's just you know like i said that's a tiring part of parenting because you want to conjure up this magic you want to be a magician for them every single day and like enliven their personality and activate their five senses and just be there for them but when you're exhausted and you're just like, I need the coffee to be done <laughs> and then I will engage with you in some sort of a fantasy <laughs> and it's just dripping down one drip at a time, <laughs> you know, it's just hard to be your best when you're tired. What's a funny story or a crazy story that's happened to the two of you? I'll do this one very quick. Snake bite? No, but that's a good one too. And then I'll just ask for next question. We got trapped in a storage unit when pre we were dating. Maybe we'd just been married. I can't remember exactly, but we got stuck in a storage unit, hanging out together. And I had to call a friend to unlock the door. Next question. <laughs> no, <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> All right. I mean, that's a crazy story, right? That is you had to crazy. call your friend and that... came and like <laughs> push the button for us because we were literally locked inside. We we're like, oh, luckily we had cell phones. I know. All right. Next question. What's something people wouldn't know about Kelly? 
me. It's weird to ask a question mm. about me. Well, <clears throat> I guess don't, I don't know if they would not know this, but I, if I'm looking at it from a perspective of somebody who like follows you or has purchased a book or taken a course or bought protein powder, like you see pictures, you see stories or are they now called reels and so mm -hmm. forth? Like you see stuff or like brand stuff or on the side of a package and it's a smiling face and it's, you know, something she loves and whatever. Like, I think that, what was the question again? What something doesn't know? Mm -hmm. Just how much like actual work you do. Like you are at a desk on a computer and a phone for eight hours a day. Like, it's not like you're just like sashaying from one luncheon to another where there's like all this glorious food and it just appears or like, Hey, they sent me this and I just heated it up. Like you're like cooking food for sharing and you're also cooking food for a family. You're also like making product like protein powder and um, making a whole ton of decisions about a, a bunch of different things and managing relationships and making sure that you are, you know, doing not only what's like required of you, but like what the right thing is to do. It's like work, like capital W or all caps. Like it's not just, you know, I don't know. I think you could like talk, like, when you think about like an actor or an actress, you're like, how hard is it to just, you know, say these lines in front of a camera? And I'm sure there's some that mail it in, but there's a bunch that really truly care and try to understand what they're acting about and like why or whatever. I don't know. It's kind of the same thing. It's like you put the work in and are doing so many other things that no one ever sees. And so it's like, I don't know. There's, it, I'm not sure if you have another book or not coming or you do, or you do slash don't, but we were talking about it and it was like maybe more personal as to like your story individually, not like here's teaching you about blood sugar balance or like plans to follow or like nutrition. It was like a little bit more about you. And one of the chapter titles was the accidental influencer. And I think that's like how I would think about you. Like you did it as part of your business because it was what, you know, allowed you to build a client roster and also share information with people. It wasn't like you set out to have that aspect be, you know, kind of like a dominant thing. And honestly, I don't even know if it is at this point, I guess I'm just saying at the end of the day, like. Kelly's doing as much work, like work, work as she is like food play. <laughs> so maybe that's something people don't know, or maybe they do. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, well, thank you for seeing that. It's, it is, it's a lot. I don't think people realize, but I love what I do and I love being my own boss and I love that I got to hire my sister. I even loved when you were my attorney. Do you want to come back and be my attorney? No, <laughs> never. <laughs> Ellie's doing a great job. <laughs> we love Ellie. Ellie's on mat leave. But speaking of which, you left a big corporate law gig to follow your dreams to write. Yes, I did. What has that transition been like for you personally? Well, I mean, going back to the transition, the transition initially was like, I mean, I'm trying to think of the song right now. It would just be like the sound of music, man. I mean, it was like running through the fields, leaping for joy and like spreading my wings. You know, you get chained to a desk in a way, having to be there all the time. And there was like, you know, seven or eight solid years where like the weekends weren't my own. Emails would come in at, 10 or two or five or seven AM or PM. And, you know, just like the constant anxiety of having to like know that 
something else was right around the corner, even though for life, it just is like, I guess in a way, lawyering is a great prep work for being a parent. So it's no, like if like the babies, the children, the toddlers, they're like partners and <laughs> they get what the F they want. And they will email you at three in the morning and be like, Hey, I gotta like, you know, I need this on my desk by eight. Like, seriously, they just are like, hey, there's poo in my diaper. <laughs> you know, like, I need you to come into the office. And you're like, okay, I was just like at like a uh, coffee brunch with my friends who were all working in tech and like sitting in like egg chairs and like, <laughs> I'll come in and do homework for eight hours. And that's what being like, I don't know, as you get further up the ladder or depending on the type of lawyer you are. But in my instance, it was... It felt like doing homework for all day. And sometimes it was really fascinating because you'd be part of deals and I did mergers and acquisitions and securities work and public and private corporations. So there was fundraising, there was going public and that was really exciting, but I just got burnt out. I got burnt out. I was about 30, I think when I pulled the, pulled the trigger to, to get out. My boss was awesome, but he had, had two heart attacks in his life. And I was like, not about to have a major organ failure. So the transition, the initial transition out was really easy because it was just like, I'm free. I can like do what I want. I don't, I'm not like answering. I'm not like, I don't know. It just was when you have a boss or somebody above you who not only demands your time and attention, but in the, in the like lawyering world, like if you screw up, like there's ways as a young associate that they kind of like can massage that or rectify it or whatever. But like your job is to not be wrong literally ever. So like whatever case you cite should be directly on point. Like over time, I think that pressure for me just became like too much. Like I always have to be right. Like I don't like none of this even matters. Like these are laws that men wrote and we live on a planet and the sun's going to explode one day. Like, what are we doing? So the transition out was very like, cool, awesome. And I spent a couple of years writing a script and I loved it. And I had some really talented friends who were agents, people in development, help me, you know, give me advice and let me like show it to them. And then we shopped it around. And unfortunately it didn't, pan out like that script didn't pan out although like three years later one virtually the same came out with the same name and from there you know that was a tough part of the transition is like you go i mean here's what it goes from you go to your parents like at this stage i don't know when i graduated law school i was 25 so i was pretty young and then you're like i guess no i was maybe 24 i don't know it was like 30 or 31 like you go from like going home and like dating somebody and your parents, friends, like asking what you're up to. And you're like, Oh, we took a company public last week. And they're just like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> like you're, you're really doing things in the world to like, what do you say to that? Like, yeah, I wrote something and everybody said no, you know? And so again, you're probably like your psychologists who listen, if they do, will probably be like, he cares too much about external validation for like, <laughs> whatever. But like, I don't know, like, that's the way I'd explain it. The transition goes from I'm super excited. I'm getting to like, follow my passion to I'm a total failure and have to report that fact to <laughs> all sorts of people in all sorts of situations. Because like, what's the first question everybody asks? It doesn't matter. Like, Oh, Hey, my name's John. Like, wh what do you do? You know? Yeah. And it's like, well, I don't, I, I'm trying to do something or I'm doing this. I'm a writer. Oh, well, what have you written? I've written a script. Oh, anything I would have seen? No. <laughs> Rejection. <laughs> Okay. What are you working on now? Other things that will likely be rejected, <laughs> you know? So it's like the transition is from like, you're this like, oh my goodness, like you went to law school. It's, it's not like being a doctor, but like a lot of the 
elders in the world would look at that as like a noble profession and you don't need to explain yourself. You could just be like, I'm a lawyer. And they'd be like, oh, he's buttoned up, honey. He's got his life together. Look at him. Yeah. It doesn't matter that he's disheveled. It's probably because he's been working so much. But like, say like, oh, I'm a writer. Oh, he's a starving artist. He's disheveled because he has no money. <laughs> and so I missed that aspect after a while. I mean, you're well paid for a reason being a lawyer. Like you spend all your time at the office and what you do is, you know, mental gymnastics at times. So that part of the transition sucked. And then we eased into, you know, Kelly and her books. She needed some help towards the end of writing her first book and then with her second book. And I was luckily able to be there for her and, you know, write a book yeah. with her, you know? So there's like, I don't know the transit, like I'm just focusing really on the word transition. Like the transition was amazing, but like the five years out and now I guess 2014, seven years, eight years out, like it's a totally different like feeling. And I think I've moved past like the, I used to walk across the street in Brentwood and be like, what are these people in these cars thinking of me? It's like 11 a.m. and I'm holding like a, you know, a laptop bag. Like, do they just think I'm the biggest D-O-U-C-H-E in the history of the world? Like, what is this guy doing? You know, all these people in the city are doing amazing things. They're working for these huge corporations that like actually do real stuff. And here I am trying to concoct a story about you know, a girl who, you know, whatever, but that's where my like psyche went to eventually. So from yippy skippy and doing backflips to like, not like, what did I do? But like, you know, I suck, you know, like, what am I doing? Like, I, I obviously wasn't good enough. And like, that's a hard pill to swallow. That's a good lesson. But anyways, I mean, it's that's just... the transition to. <laughs> it's so heartbreaking for me to hear you say this out loud. I mean, I mean, we've obviously talked about it a bunch. And I just like background color, like you were always an overachiever, you know, from. <laughs> Don't say that, mom, up. Don't say it. Don't That's say fine. It. You're fine. You don't need to say it. I know, but. Well, when you achieve or like do things or you do well, like that's just what you do. I know. You know, so when you don't do that, I mean, again, I don't know what self-help book or psychologist guest you've had, but there's probably a buzzword for it. That's like, this is like, this is, <laughs> what would this be called? Expectation deficiency. You know, it's like something like your expectations, what your expectations were, you just don't hit, you know, and what you know you're capable of, you don't. And when you get that, it's like adversity in your brain. And I realize in the grand scheme of things, there's virtually zero adversity. You know, we live in a first world country, we have clean water, we have food, we have roads that are paved, like, we're extremely lucky. I'm only talking in like the extremely specific sense of like, ambitious, high achieving human, like that disappointment as to what you've been always is Difficult. Next question. Well, what's next? I mean, I'm still, I'm working my way back into writing, you know, I think taking over kind of the primary caregiving role with the kids and I wouldn't even call it primary. I would just say you are there most of the time. You are the primary <laughs> caregiver. Yeah. But I mean, I'm not like, we um, co-parent, <laughs> I guess I, I mean, we mom and dad. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't know. I'd like to continue writing. I'd like to do something with my brain. I don't just want to like, I mean, it's great to use brain power for the kids, but it's, 
it's weird. I mean, it's not like a, I don't know, I guess it depends. I'm sure there's moms and dads out there who are like that. It fills my bucket completely, but it doesn't for me. Like I need something that's my own that I can like hang my own little hat on because I don't want to hang it on my kids. Like I don't want to put that pressure on them. A B I don't want to like have nothing for myself whenever they have themselves for themselves we're all selves i know i want that for you too and i think we try i think we both try to like prioritize our our time i mean i love that we have help now a little more consistently and that you are getting time to yourself to go do that because i mean selfishly i know i know the if problem i is just that I've been... stole your story and sent it to my editor she would buy it yeah and that's really frustrating for me i bet it is i know I mean, like, but I also, you have to be the one to do that. I do. It'll be like a moment. It'll be like, I'm a weeblo transitioning to, no, that's like a boy scout joke. I don't remember what you go from to get to weeblos, but I was a tiger cub and you cross the bridge and you turn into whatever you turn into next. But yeah, we'll see working on some stuff now, but it's much more basic. It's children's stuff. So. Writing rhymes is how I'm passing the time. <laughs> I love it. Um, how do you two... Oh, well, let's do this one. Is Be Bad by Chris really bad? Pretty bad. I mean, not terrible, but like, for instance, tonight, I got a pizza and it's got sausage, pepperoni, and some other meat on it. It's like the carnivore one. And that's kind of like a once a week type of- You really drink smoothies was another question. I do. I really do. Like, here's my mindset on smoothies. You're doing it for like three reasons. One, and as a, as, as an adult just, human male. Yeah, just you being you. Just me being me. It's like, okay, how can I have like two huge handfuls of greens? Like, am I going to make a salad later? Like, am I going to make the salad? Like, no, I don't like, I like ordering salads. Like I like someone else for whatever reason. Like when you get a salad somewhere at a restaurant or whatever, you're like, oh, it's a salad. And like, look at all this stuff. We got little, little, this is gnats everywhere. And they put it all together. They've thought through this, like a salad at home is just like plop. There's the spinach plop. There's the chicken. Maybe I'll put cucumbers in <laughs> and then you put ranch on it or whatever. Primer ranch was great. But like, there's no fun there. There's no like, there's no zip. There's no zest. So how am I going to get those greens in my body on a daily basis? And like, literally, that's how I think about it. I know spinach and greens have magnesium. And sometimes I get that restless leg. And I've noticed like when I eat greens, I don't, you know, like consistently. So it's kind of like, this is, imagine you're in the matrix and they feed them that gruel and it has like the most basic nutrients. I'm just like, this is my like basic nutrient that I need green thing. So that's one level. That's one reason I do it. Number two is I do find that it actually makes me make better decisions later or when at least I like plan it out, like I feel healthier. I don't know if I am, but I feel that way. And if you feel healthier, like maybe you'll make a different decision later on. And I don't remember what the third reason was or even what the question was, but <laughs> do you like, do you, do you like your smoothie yeah, and what, do like, you, what do you put in your smoothie? I'm a straight up, like I'll put the almond milk, two cups. I do two full scoops of protein powder. So like, I know that as like yours, for instance, has like 23 grams of protein. So I'm getting like 40. Yeah. And I know you said like, that's only for like, hardcore athletes like you're a hardcore yeah. athlete babe yeah, not okay. really but i kind of like go a little more on the protein then i will either do so this is where there's a fork in the road do i go avocado or do i go peanut butter i don't do both because that's my like fat if i go avocado i go avocado and then i put spinach in and chia seeds and it's kind of just like vanilla 
vanilla <laughs> yum. Green stuff. <laughs> vanilla green stuff. But it tastes good and yours really does taste good. If we go peanut butter, I might go chocolate protein powder, but it's the same thing. I just like, those are the two ways. And I never do fruit. Like I just never do. I know. I well, just don't feel like, like for me, that's not like the point of the smoothie is for it to taste good. And I'm not saying it tastes bad. I'm just saying like the point isn't for me to be like, oh, I'm at Jamba and like, woo. <laughs> it's like, this is like fuel and nutrition for the cells to do what they need to do and to set me up later for success. So the propaganda has worked. <laughs> I am, you know, I'm doing a little more fruit with the kids these days, you know, a few blueberries and like whatever. And it does make an impact. The banana does definitely haven't dived into the apple. But like, again, like, I don't need to be convinced that a smoothie is good for me. And I don't need to be like, my taste buds don't need to like be like doing backflips, like, you know, the inner goddess style Anastasia Steele <laughs> to like, say this is a good thing. They just like are like, oh, this is good. Right. What's Next. your... What's your next, next question? question? <laughs> You're like, okay, all done. All done podcast. Let's see. You can ask me everything. I mean, mm. just keep going. I know, but we kind of jumped around. You need a pen? <laughs> you cross stuff out. out. Yeah, you know, it's not really my thing. <laughs> <laughs> see, now if I was doing this, and this is my podcast, I, I would have had like, oh, it would have gone, I would know exactly where I was and I know, but I then know. I'd rather I'm not just, making fun of you. It's just, I'd rather this just is the flow. difference between, me. I know you're I know. good flow. No, I don't know. What, well, what is the difference between us? I mean. Like, who is Chris as a person? I'm sure people who listen to the podcast already are like, they already know. You? No, I mean, just like what the difference is. You probably talk a certain way and come off with like a certain vibe and I probably come off with a different one. <laughs> So, <laughs> What's your vibe, babe? No, my vibes. I don't know. I mean, well, the whole reason for this podcast is that we're celebrating our ten-year wedding anniversary. So I'll ask this one: How did you know Kelly was the one, and when? I think I knew back in that bar when I yelled her name at her at full volume. I don't know. You know, I didn't have a lot of girlfriend experience prior to that I did but not like extensive or even you know I don't know I'm sure like a lot of guys would have <laughs> wanted to get to know her as well I just I don't know I just knew well uh, this question's for me too and for me, it was probably, probably, that's probably not a good thing to say. I don't know what you're going to say. So I have no <laughs> idea if probably is, should it be actually or likely? Yeah, actually. Okay. No, I mean, I think I knew, I think I knew back in the beginning. I just thought you were so like at the first bar, not at the bar where you yelled your name at me and like. I mean, I wouldn't have known that we were going to end up together, but not that I stalked you, but I just felt different. Like, I felt like you were so kind and so present. And like I said, so humble, I was really attractive. And I see that that's still like one of the number one reasons why I love you is like the way that you treat your friends and your family, like just being the guy that puts in the effort to write the email to our friend group that's funny and is trying to connect with people and make people feel good about themselves and to celebrate other people. And you're, you're the glue. Like, I feel like you're, you really take the time to show up for your friends and your family and your kids and for me, and you've always been that way. I mean, I think recently family has required it. I think, in the past, friends got more of it because family didn't require it. And I mean, not only like 
the nu- our nuclear family, but like Your my parents. family. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could write those emails to my friends again, you know, like, but I was trying to escape being a lawyer in an office at 9 p.m., you know, like, yeah, so I, I'm, I think I'm a different person than I was then, but so is everybody. I know. I think that's one of the great things when I, when I see like a young 20 something and they are just like looking at open road and not giving an F and like, what are you doing? I'm like, bro, you are going to be in my shoes in 15 years. Like you're going to be raising kids and trying to do the right thing. And, you know, I think the world needs a dose of humbleness to begin with. I don't know. That's not an answer. I don't even know if there's a question. (laughs) Can we take a small break? Yes. (laughs) Thank you for listening to Be Well by Kelly. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at bewellbykelly.com and follow me on Instagram at bewellbykelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers. 